Konnichiwa. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here in Japan and I'm very grateful to um, Sasakawa Foundation, but also Nippon Foundation to invite me as an Asia opinion leader. And um, thank you very much, Madam Chano, for uh, introducing myself, but also introducing the background to this lecture as well. Now, um, this year, we're celebrating 25th anniversary of the democratic changes in Mongolia. As Madame Chano pointed out, in 1990, uh, like many post-communist countries like Eastern Europe and uh, even Russia, we had uh, calls for democratic changes and market economy. And uh, in April 1990, which will be 25 years ago, for the first time, we introduced multi-party democracy after 70 years of um, what used to be a communist state-run uh, economy. It's already 25 years, of course, we look back and say, okay, um, we've done many reforms. Some of them, them have been successful. Uh, some of them, of course, we're not very happy about. So I would like to share some of the um, experiences that we had. Many of you probably know that Mongolia is actually Territory-wise, it's a very large country with a small population. Three weeks ago, Mongolia's population reached three million. So uh, <laughs> we're very happy that it's growing, but of course, uh, for so uh, it is the least densely populated country in the world. And of course, one would have, think, one would have thought uh, it's a small population, so probably it's manageable and it's easy to manage, but of course we have our own challenges as well. Of course, Mongolia is landlocked. We are situated between two major superpowers, China and Russia. It also makes challenges with uh, transporta transportation, logistics, and being landlocked and having a small market. It's not also easy as well. Now, um, in the last 25 years of the transition, of course, it, because it was 100% state-owned economy, no private sector. It was a very isolated country um, because of the Cold War, but also because of the cold relations between China and Russia, Mongolia, or then Soviet Union. Um, Mongolia, for us, for Mongolians, the whole world was only Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So that was the whole world. Every, everything else was completely far away and uh, not known to us. So when, in 1990, Mongolia opened up, uh, we faced on one side, it was very, very exciting uh, that Mongolia was opening up. Of course, on the other side, it was very, very challenging as well. We had to change laws, legislations, institutions, but I think the biggest challenge was to change our mentality as well. Now, um, economy, of course, collapsed at the beginning of the 90s because all the traditional links, which was mostly with the communist countries and Soviet unions, have collapsed. Uh, we ran into very big, um, maybe, I don't know whether you can see, I think you can see the graphs. We um, faced, all of a sudden, of course, economic economy started collapsing and we had minus growth. So that's 1990, the first few years, especially until mid 90s, all of a sudden it was minus economic growth. And um, inflation, for example, in 1992 reached 350%. Can you imagine, you know, inflation uh, being 300% over a year? So, um, and uh, um, we tried to stabilize the economy and we, um, maybe towards the end of the 90s, we started growing slowly. But it was a very sm small, tiny economy. Even in 1998, when I entered the parliament for the first time, our economy was one billion US dollar economy. And the uh, state budget was about 300 million US dollars. So um, then, w once it's, st although it's stabilized and the economy started growing, it was very, very difficult to uh, come up with the ideas to expand the economy because, on one side, market is very small, just less than 3 million. On the other side, because we're landlocked, we're far away from the ports. Uh, far away from the markets, and because China has been growing so fast and they became a manufacturer of the world, uh, for the small economy to expand, we need to export things, isn't it? And in order to export, 
uh, to compete with China's manufacturing is very, very difficult. We could uh, develop it a bit of Kashmir agriculture in this industry, a bit of tourism, but Mongolia was still uh, not very no well known to the world. And only when commodity prices started going up in 2001, 2002, uh, when natural resources prices started going up, then we started having uh, a real opportunity for the economy to grow. So it's from 2001, all of a sudden you see economy growing, except 2009 when there was a financial slowdown and economic crisis around the world, when commodity prices for one or two years started went down. So that's when you see this dip in our economy and then it's going up again. So. Um, from 2004 and 5 until, well, for the last 10 years, on an average, economic growth was any, anything from 5 to 15, even 17 percent is the highest growth, which was in 2012. And for the last three years, it's going down again. And it actually follows very clearly the commodity prices as well. Again, whether we like it or not. So you see in the early 90s, when we had the transition, commodity prices were relatively low. And uh, from 2001 and 2, this is the gold price, this is copper price. Uh, so you s if you integrate, if you look at the, our economic growth and the, at the commodity prices, they correlate very much. And then even in 2009, you see this dip in the prices. And then in the last two, three years, you also see the dip in the prices as well. Most of the um, exports will be copper, gold. More recently, it's coking coal. Even coking coal uh, was not competitive to export. It wasn't, eco it wasn't economically profitable to export until only a few years ago. For example, there is a mine called Tavan Tolgo, which is one of the largest coking coal deposits in the world now. But it was discovered 40 years ago. Although it was discovered 40 years ago, government owned it. It was, and government was offering to Japan, to everybody else, at the beginning of the 90s, when the times were very difficult, government was saying, please invest, and government will not want anything for that. Please invest and create jobs. Uh, we will create very good foreign investment conditions, but it was just not economic at all then. So people don't understand why, not necessarily understand why it's just the last few years that commodities, no, mining is developing in Mongolia. We had some of the deposits discovered even 20, 30 years ago. It was just not economically feasible. Of course, with China growing and uh, demand, Chinese demand for energy and resources have been growing dramatically as well. That, of course, led to what's called super cycle super cycle of the prices in commodities and also infrastructure got closer to the Mongolian border as well. Uh, just transportation took a lot of um, profits as well and that's why, you know, once infrastructure got closer to the, to the Mongolian border from the Chinese side and commodity prices were up, it's only from 2001 two that Mongolia actually started having some opportunity to, to expand the economy. Of course, we don't like that we're, we're so much dependent on uh, mining and commodities, but this is the reality and uh, our opinion is that although it's very risky to be dependent only on mining and we want to diversify uh, our economy, uh, we feel that with our, since 1990s, when you say until 2004, five, those 15 years were very desperate, very difficult years, and that's why we think, okay, even if we don't, whether we like it or not, we have to uh, develop mining initially. We have to accumulate some income, both for the government, but also for the companies and for the um, population as well. And then invest the income into health and education and IT and other economic sectors to develop. Although you see very impressive growth figures, uh, as I said, anything from five to, um, so we go back, which is like this, yes. Even though you see very impressive economic growth figures, it doesn't mean that things have been going very well in the last few years. Of course, GDP, which I told you was only one billion US dollars, maybe in 99, 98, uh, has grown more than 10 times 
This year's GDP is about 11 billion US dollars. The state budget, which I mentioned was only 300 million dollars, has rose 20 times to about 6 billion dollars. But um, this is not, it's just because initially the starting point was very small. I mean, it was just such a small economy. It just looks like it's going ten, tenfold, twentyfold, economic growth more than 10%. But we, because we started from a very small base, it's not enough. This economic growth and the, some of the wealth that is being created in the last few years is not enough actually to solve all the pressing issues that we have accumulated, not only in the last transition years, but also uh, before the transition years. So, you know, we need uh, to build so much infrastructure, roads, energy, schools, hospitals. We, we need to, you know, improve the living standards of the people as well. Half of the population of Ulaanbaatar still lives in what's called Ger district, and some of you may have seen that. It's uh, half live in apartment blocks, but half live in a Ger district where we don't have uh, infrastructure, running water, or centralized heating as well. And that's why, for example, air pollution in Ulaanbaatar is a number one environmental problem for Ulaanbaatar because half of the population, still 200,000 households have individual stoves to heat their homes in winter. And they, of course, coal is the cheapest and simplest way to heat the houses as well. <coughs> now, um, Japan was one of the um, very early and main partners and supporters of uh, Mongolia from early 1990s. And Mon Japan was the main um, country that supported and helped Mongolia with this transition and also helped to um, raise and mobilize the donor support as well. So Mongolians are very, very grateful actually for Japan and Japanese people's support for this transition. And uh, I'm very happy to announced that, say that last week uh, we signed, Mongolia and Japan signed economic partnership agreement and our Prime Minister Sekhen Bilek was here on the visit and then he signed with uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe economic partnership agreement. And this week our parliament is discussing and hopefully will be approving the EPA and hopefully we will have more economic trade and business and investment opportunities uh, following the EPA as well. Even with the economic growth, if you ask what is the top, what is the most pressing issue still Mongolia is facing, is still, I think, I would say poverty, income, uh, and uh, jobs as well. This is economic growth. So this is the poverty rates. Um, so you see here 2011, 2012, 2012. 2013 figure, so it's gone down from 39% of the population to 20, 20, about 25% of the population, which lives below the minimum living standard, so one-fourth of the population. So with the economic growth, uh, after many years, fortunately, the poverty is going down, but until 2010, 2011, for many years since 1990, the numbers were about 36%, so one third of the population for many years you know, um, uh, were under the poverty level. It's just the uh, economic growth is trickling down now to reducing the poverty. Of course, gap between rich and poor is still uh, a problem, but um, we hope that things will progress as well. So um, let me just tell you um, uh, an example of how in transition periods um, we are learning on mistakes. Mongolia, in the, um, at the beginning of the 90s, we decided, okay, because we had state-run economy, communism for 70 years, Mongolia opened up and we decided, of course, it's also many East European countries, as you know, as well. We decided, okay, it has to be Everything should be um, based on market economy and we leave the market and capitalism to resolve everything. So we privatized, liberalized, freed everything. And we said, for example, uh, I'm using mining as an example. 
Mining is business as usual. Government will not get involved with mining. Even if we own some of the mining projects, we'll just let it go to private sector. Let the private sector develop, create jobs and pay taxes. And uh, so we created very favorable conditions for foreign investment at the beginning of the 90s. And um, we said, okay, the whole of Mongolia is open for mining. Anybody who can come, whether it's Mongolian or foreign, first come, first served, you apply for exploration and mining license and you can just have it. And please just create jobs and pay taxes and we are not going to get involved as a government as well. So it was very, what we call liberal on the right side policies, leaving everything to the market. That was in early, mid 90s, late 90s, until 2000, maybe five, six, when commodity prices went very high. All of a sudden we realized um, 45% of the country um, was covered by mining and exploration licenses, but we didn't actually demand too much from the in uh, investors, whether it's domestic or foreign. We, they didn't even have to pay high license fees. They didn't have to, uh, investors didn't have to do uh, minimum expenditure on exploration on mining. It was just le left to the market. And of course, also, unfortunately, a large number of small-scale, what's called alluvial plaza mining, which mostly is in the valleys, was, uh, it's, they're not big mines, they are small mines, but a large number was digged and environment was not rehabilitated. So, of course, you would have a backfire and both local government, but also politicians and public became more and more unhappy and saying, okay, why is environment is not being rehabilitated? Why... Um, why most of the, we are not seeing profits coming to the majority of the population. And uh, how come when prices are so high, government is not receiving enough of the taxes? And that's why all of a sudden, having very liberal economic policies, leaving everything to the market, all of a sudden we started moving very much to the left with the policies. What, wha what I would call populist and resource nationalist policies. And again, it's not only Mongolia. When commodities prices became crazy, resource-rich countries also, didn't many resource-rich countries didn't escape this populist resource nationalist policies like Latin America, but also even in Australia, for example, you would hear some of the rhetoric of super profits tax as well. So Mongolia didn't escape that either. So all of a sudden, you know, um, I'm a geologist by profession. I worked in the mining industry, so I could see f both from the that industry side, but also as a politician uh, uh, as well. So um, all of a sudden, the everybody in the politics, but in the public will call, no, no, we can't leave everything to, to the market. Uh, we need to, government should get involved. Government should have a stake. There should be more government participation. We should increase the taxes. So fr we moved. Um, to calling, you know, for what's called windfall profits tax. So we introduced very high windfall profits tax on copper and gold on 68%. If prices would be high <laughs> from gold and copper uh, projects, we'll ask for 68% uh, high taxes, uh, which was, I think, a bit crazy. Uh, and also, uh, the politicians started promising cash from my, all of a sudden we thought, oh, we're going to become very rich within the nec next few years because, you know, everybody's interested in mining commodities and energy and resources and resources is becoming a big, uh, great game. So we're going, within a few years when economy started growing, more revenue started flowing into economy. There was a lot of interest from investors from 2005, 6, 7. And then uh, when prices were crazy, politicians also became a bit crazy. So they said, okay, We'll promise cash. So for 2008 parliamentary elections, the ma we have two main political parties in the parliament and I represent a smaller third party. So the main competition between the two political parties was who will promise more cash. So one party promised $1,000 worth of cash to every citizen in the country. Uh, and the other party promised, no, no, we'll promise $1,500 to every citizen. And then they, uh, the next promise was, oh, we'll give se $70 every month to every su student. And then the other promise was, no, we'll give $100 to every new, uh, new child born. The next was, oh, no, $500 to every newlywed family. 
So every, there was a big competition on populist promises in 2008, which uh, was um, a big problem, of course, because we could see from 2008 until 2012 elections, although economy was growing, we couldn't deliver, no, not we, the main parties. I, I, I was very honest and I would say, no, 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 this is not realistic promise. Uh, this is very bad for economy. And not that politicians didn't know that it was a bad promise, it's just they couldn't resist you know, competing <laughs> with the promises in order to win. So uh, within four years, we understood that we can't, uh, we can't deliver on promises. So every citizen, on an average, received $500 worth of cash or student uh, scholarships or children's money. But um, although 100% it was not delivered, we ended up, even now, we ended up with a lot of loans, debt from those promises. So we created a very nice fund called Human Development Fund, and the idea was to invest into health and education, but we already accumulated now almost $500 million debt in that Human Development Fund because we uh, distributed cash. So that's bad news with our policies, but we also have good news. Good news is that we're learning very fast on the mistakes and repairing those mistakes. It costs us a lot, but uh, for example, Windfall profits tax, the 68% profits tax was abolished only two, three years later. And uh, it was replaced by so-called sliding royalty. So we had very low, because it was leaving everything to the market, supporting private sector. We went from supporting to not supporting, but then we, we came up with more clever ideas saying, okay, we shouldn't um, tax so much, but w when prices are high, we'll have slightly higher royalties. When prices are low, we'll have lower royalties. We call it sliding royalties, so it was replaced by sliding royalty tax. Cash handouts no more exist, and even in the, we had to put in legislation into before 2012 elections, we put in the election legislation that political parties cannot promise cash. If they promise cash, or if they, in the platform, they promise more than budget can afford, actually the election committee will not register the parties. Uh, they will look at the platform. So the good news that we're uh, actually uh, repairing our mistakes, uh, hopefully not uh, relatively fast. There was also, we didn't have very good foreign investment review procedures. And because we didn't have that, we also Abo uh, introduced before 2012 a legislation called Investing in Strategic Sectors of Economy, which includes mining, banking, and telecommunication. And if you invest in those sectors, more than $80 million, it has to go through government and parliament decision. So it was very, very bureaucratic and cumbersome. So that deterred a lot of investment before 2012 election. So there was a lot of investment com coming 2005, 6, 7. And before 2012 elections, all of a sudden, all the investors became a bit scared because some of these changes in the legislation. But we, after a year and a half, in 2013, we again repaired that bad legislation, and now we have a, a relatively good uh, foreign investment review procedures. It doesn't have to go through the parliament, and we're learning fast, but unfortunately, we're losing time in between. You know? And because many people's jobs and incomes are at stake, when commodity prices were high, uh, I feel that if we didn't jump from too much to the right, too much to the left policies, if we stayed in the middle, moderate, with the moderate policies, long term, especially as mining, then we would have, should have done much better. But you have to understand that Mongolia doesn't have a track record of, we don't have a history of investment in Mongolia like many other countries, say Australia or Chile, they ha or even Indonesia, they have a relatively longer history of investment in mining. So they learned in, in those last decades, but we're just learning in the last, more or less, even less than 10 years. But again, the good news that we're uh, hoping to, uh, to, to re repair those mistakes as well. Now, um, I would like to tell you a little bit in the second part about foreign policy because I uh, also served as a foreign minister between 2007 and 2008. I would like very briefly to tell you about um, our policy called third neighbor policy, and it is, relates also to Japan as well, <coughs> and Mongolia-Japanese relationship. As I told you, because we had uh, 70 years of being 
history of very isolated, being part of Comic Con, communist bloc, and too much dependent on Soviet Union, both politically and economically as well. And before that, uh, before communism, of course, we for about more than 200 years, we um, also were um, un under Manchu Chinese domination as well. So when 1990 came and Mongolia opened up, for the first time Mongolia could actually formulate our own foreign policy. So we were of course very, very excited, but we were also uh, th thought very seriously about our new foreign policy. And um, one thing was very obvious to us and said, okay, we can't be too much dependent on only one country. And because we're located between the two main um, neighbors, China and Russia, two big superpowers, nuclear powers, um, of course, we have to have very good relations with two countries. So that's very obvious. So we will have very good relations both with China and Russia, but we will balance those relations. We will have with both balanced relations, hopefully. We don't have a third neighbor geographically, but we came up with the terminology and the idea of third neighbor. That is, we would proactively seek very good political and economic relations with the leading countries of the East and the West, so that to counterbalance the influence of the two neighbors. Of course, the, ve the most natural and thing is maybe uh, to sell goods to China and Russia or to get investment from China, especially with resources and energy. The most of the demand is on, uh, from China. So of course, this, the easiest and simplest thing is that just to sell to China, get investment from China or from Russia. But <coughs> We would like to have a balance. We understand that it's too risky to be dependent on only one country. And that's why our foreign policy, which was approved, foreign policy concept, which was approved in 1994, also what's called national security concept. And it was upgraded and updated a few years ago, uh, has what's called multi-pillar foreign policy um, definition. And that we will be proactively seeking uh, very good relations with third neighbors, and Japan is considered one of our best third neighbors in a Asia. Of course, United States, European Union, more recently, countries like Canada and Australia, because some of the mining investment is there. Uh, that's, these are our third neighbors. And um, as I mentioned, we enjoyed very good relations with Japan, and uh, we have what's called strategic partnership with Japan. And it's only a few countries that we have strategic partnership with. And um, we uh, currently were in what's called medium term plan implementation of the strategic partnership 2013 2017. We have, uh, we enjoy also common values, and diplomatic relations were established in 1972, uh, Madame Chano mentioned, and we, cel we celebrated. Uh, recently two years ago, 40th anniversary as well. Now, although it's a small country, we decided that we should be also very active on um, international scene within the United Nations. And um, that's why, for example, Third Neighbor, we also consider some of the international organizations as well. And um, uh, one of our, in the last 10 years, we um, contributed very actively to the peacekeeping operations and per capita, because it's a small per, per capita, contrib among the per capita contribution, contributions, Mongolia is considered one of the highest per capita contributors to uh, peacekeeping operations. Uh, we, car we currently have, we were sending troops to um, Sudan, Sierra Leone, uh, but also Afghanistan and contributing, we were contributing troops to United Nations PKO as well. And we became very, um, now becoming more experienced in that as well. Now, um, in Asia, of course, the, our main objective is to strengthen our position in Asia, especially in Northeast and Central Asia. Um, we, um, Want, we would like to contribute also to North East Asia dialogue and become an honest facilitator to that. 
And uh, although we are not officially party to the six party talks, which st stalled somehow, uh, our president, Elbeck Dorch, for example, launched what's called Ulaanbaatar North East Asian Security Dialogue uh, initiative. And it's aimed first and foremost at reducing suspicion and developing confidence in the region. Now, the idea is not to address necessarily so-called hardcore security issues, but rather start with issues on which common understanding could be reached, such as economic cooperation, common environmental challenges, non-traditional non security threats. And um, we, we will be hosting in 2016 Asia ASEM, Asia Europe uh, high level meeting. And our president, Elbeck Dorch, has been very active also negotiating with individual uh, top leaders in Northeast Asia to pursue Ulaanbaatar dialogue. And that's, um, I think, very important in the region. There is one example of also our active foreign policy, and I would like to mention that. It's uh, an example of nuclear weapon-free status. Uh, it, it, the idea came in 1992. Uh, again, you know, because we're a big territory between the two superpowers and both are nuclear powers. We uh, initiated to ensure that Mongolia's territory is never used to harm the interests of other countries, including of its neighbors, nor contribute to altering the strategic balance to the detriment of regional confidence and stability. So we um, declared our Mongolia's territory as nuclear weapons free uh, status, nuclear weapons free country. And um, if the status is properly institutionalized, Mongolia will be contributing some 1.5 million square kilometers, which is our territory of the vast land area to the world's emerging nuclear weapon free area. There are nuclear weapon-free zones and nuclear weapon-free areas uh, in the world where different countries are cooperating to create those zones. But because Mongolia uh, is landlocked between the two big countries, we decided, okay, we, we are declaring our country as nuclear weapon-free status. And 2012, two years ago, we actually succeeded uh, five nuclear weapon states, they're called P5 at the UN. Uh, they pledged in a joint declaration in New York to respect Mongolia's unique status and not to contribute to any act that would violate it. So um, I think it's also uh, Mongolia's this initiative can also contribute to the region's greater confidence and stability. Until uh, December last year, uh, I acted as the Minister of Environment and Green Development in Mongolia. Uh, the government has changed two months ago, so I'm a member of parliament now. And since I was an um, environment minister, I must tell you a few things about Mongolia's environment as well. Um, one fourth of the population still live as nomadic herders, uh, semi-nomadic herders. And population is three million, but the livestock number is 50 million. So in December, uh, it reached 50 million. <coughs> it's growing relatively fast during the transition times because uh, livestock was privatized. And uh, because uh, one fourth still live as nomadic herders, they're directly dependent on pastures. And our nature, which is relatively very pristine, and pastures are relatively pristine, but um, they're very fragile. It's a low precipitation. Uh, about 8% of the country is covered by forests uh, and the climate change, which Mongolia didn't really contribute too much to because it's a small population, no industry, we don't really emit too much uh, CO2 or greenhouse gases. Mongolia was disproportionately affected by climate change. So uh, some of you may know that the average global warming is about 0.7, 0.8 degrees Celsius, but Mongolia warmed up three times more intensely than the rest of the world. It's <laughs> since 1940s, when the measurement started in Mongolia, Mongolia warmed up by 2.14 degrees Celsius. And um, 
Somebody was asking me, oh, if it's warmer now, it's very cold in Mongolia, so if it's slightly warmer, it's good for you. <laughs> but actually, it's not true because it's a very, as you know, ec ecosystem has to be in balance. And if the balance slightly changes, it creates a lot of negative consequences. So uh, we see drier climate influencing uh, drying up rivers and lakes. Pasture degradation uh, is also going, uh, and then desertification is also progressing. About 40% of glaciers, we have a lot of glaciers, although, um, <coughs> well, we have uh, in the northern and also western part, high mountain areas, 4,300 meters will be the highest peak. We have a lot of glaciers and uh, uh, permanent snow as well. And about 40% of glaciers and permanent snow has actually melted since 19. 20s when uh, also one can compare, you know, some of that as well. And even permafrost has started thawing as well, which is very dangerous as well, because it's er maybe p potentially will lead to erosion of soil, etc. Although we disproportionately have been affected by climate change, we also don't want to sit idle and complain. Also, we've been undertaking, uh, you know, a climate change national program. And last year, I'm proud to say that um, uh, our Minister of Environment uh, managed to um, persuade the Parliament to get what's called Green Development Strategy passed in the Parliament. So the idea is we don't want to, now that the economy is growing and that we are developing faster than before, we don't want to go old brown way. If we go forward, we want to go cleaner, greener and uh, um, high technology way. So. By 2030, energy demand in Mongolia is uh, planned to be, is, is going to quadruple. Uh, if 10 years ago we, there will be only a few thousand housing apartments being built, last year we built 20,000 housing apartments, and this year's plan is about 30,000 housing. A few, again, 10 years ago, only uh, maybe dozens of schools kindergartens and dormitories will be built. And currently there is a demand for 1,100 uh, buildings and education sector. So, and because it's a very cold climate, heating is a major problem. And because we have so much coal, the uh, most s easiest way is to produce energy from coal, whether it's a power station or whether it's heating schools or households. But we don't want to go, you know, this easy, simple and dirty brown way. So we're conscientiously promoting, for example, renewable energy. About 80% of our energy mix this, uh, at the current time is from renewable energy. Uh, although coal produced energy is still cheaper than renewable energy, we have feed in tariffs, we have a lot of uh, tax benefits and tax uh, holidays for renewable energy uh, producers. We also uh, put zero tariffs on importing renewable energy equipment and we're trying conscientiously to support you know, wind, solar, but also hydropower as well. Uh, we, for the first 50 megawatt uh, wind power mill went into operation a uh, year and a half ago and it's feeding into the Ulaanbaatar electricity grid. And um, so as part of the green development strategy, we're hoping to work more closely with Japan and we, signed, we were the first country to sign bilateral agreement with Japan on low carbon development, what's called bilateral offset crediting mechanism, which is uh, uh, government of Japan will be in, uh, subsidizing some private sector, Japanese private sector, Mongolian private sector cooperation into low carbon uh, technologies and investment so that they can compete with brown uh, high energy, not high, low energy efficiency, um, obsolete technology. <coughs> and uh, this morning I had a very interesting meeting with the Ministry of Environment discussing how we can progress that as well. Now, <coughs> we also decided on an environmental uh, side that we don't have to open the whole country off for mining. So it's, I told you that at some point 45% of the country was covered by mining and exploration licenses. Now it's down to less than 10% because we decided we need to get some of the areas under the protection. We need to protect rivers and forests. And uh, so uh, about 17% of the countries are national parks and protected areas. 
and about 15% are locally protected areas as well. And uh, we are more wisely opening up some areas for mining. We're not just saying, okay, the whole of country is open. We have to be very careful, and uh, I think there is enough potential for uh, 3 million population. Now, um, <coughs> just one uh, sentence, and I will go for question and answers. We are very keen to go for sustainable development. And uh, as I mentioned before, the, the, uh, if I look back at the 25 years, I think, of course, it's easy, probably not that difficult to change the legislation, institutions, but the biggest challenge for us was to change, to change our mentality. We're still, I think, in the process of changing our mentality. We've done a lot of reforms and changes, but now it's time for us to sit down and work hard and work on, ev on hard on day-to-day -day details. Like I think we can learn a lot from Japanese, how loyally and how hardworking uh, Japanese are, are on very particular detailed issues. And uh, Chinggis Hans, there is a famous Chinggis Han saying with Chinggis Hans had when he was conquering the world. It's easy to conquer uh, the world on the horse but it's much more difficult to get down from the horse and rule the country. So I think with all the reforms and changes, I think it's time for us to sit down and do hard work. And as they say, devil is in detail, so we have to work very hard on improving the, um, um, improving the li uh, livelihood of, uh, and living standards of the people as well. And that's the number one um, tar uh, objective of uh, our, us Mongolians, I think. So thank you very much for very patiently listening to, to me and I hope that... Thank you very much. Um, Sekisa, <coughs> with Japan, of course, we would, um, for the regional security, we would like to keep as good relationship as possible, like we are enjoying very good relationship. And uh, if um, Japan can also support our president's initiative on, you know, uh, dialogue between in Northeast Asia, uh, Mongolia has very good relations with both China, but also South and North Korea, but also with Japan. We don't have uh, too many disputes, you know, neither with um, South or North Korea. And also with Russia, we have very good uh, relationships as well. So we think that we can contribute somewhat to the dialogue between those um, uh, Northeast Asian countries. And um, as I mentioned previously, if it's very difficult to have a hardcore issues discussed, you know, between Japan and North Korea, Japan, Korea, or China, we can start with semi, what our president calls 1.5 track, which is maybe um, not traditional hardcore issues, but maybe, you know, issues of environment or uh, other issues of um, non-traditional security threats, economic cooperation, and we feel that maybe we can facilitate to become an honest facilitator for that as well. Of course, if uh, it's not only political diplomatic relationship, but on at all the levels, you know, um, cultural, uh, NGO level, also regional, you know, our Embassy, for example, has been very active in the last year, seeking relationship not only at the top level, but also with regions of Japan, with the towns, and if there is more sort of um, public diplomacy, that's also very good to create a good relationship. And of course, we look, we look for more and more investment from, Jap from Japan, economic and trade, and as I mentioned, economic partnership agreement, APA, which was signed last week and hopefully adopted by two parliaments within the next few months <coughs> that will hope will give some incentive for better trade and investment as well now um atsuda san ask for internet generational gap generation gap i think <coughs> uh, my generation for example which was brought up and grew up both during the communism and the transition period and the market economy. Um, if you, I don't know what um, 
maybe uh, Yuki will tell me what generation gap it generally means in anthropology, but uh, our mentality is slightly different probably from the new generation mentality. And of course, um, uh, they will have a much more progressive and open mind. And of course, there are pluses and minuses probably in both generations. But I read a very interesting uh, sentence one day that the new generation always looks much further. They see much further and they're much more progressive because they're standing on the shoulders of the giants and they could see further. But um, I don't think there is a big generation ba gap, but only if you look from, you know, our, um, th this point of view that we, uh, there's a different, different economies and different uh, democratic communist regime that we lived. But just uh, not generation gap, but if you look at the pyramid, uh, population pyramid, Japanese population pyramid is like this, we know, and our generation is pyramid is like this. About 70% of the population is less than 35 year old. So we have a lot of young people and uh, potential, uh, potential, you know, um, contributors to the economy as well. I don't know whether <coughs> that's the question you asked, but uh, if not, you can s s stay on and clarify more. Now, nomadic herders, where the, a lot of uh, foreigners also ask whether this traditional semi-nomadic, nomadic livestock herding, traditional way of life is actually contradicting with the market economy. How are we going, how, is, uh, how are they going to survive in the market economy in, in general? And um, I think the last 25 years showed that actually nomadic herding can actually survive. Of course, many young, many children of nomadic herders would like to go to Ulaanbaatar. There, is a, there has been a lot of internal migration from countryside into Ulaanbaatar in the search of new jobs and better health services, better education. But it, uh, the last 25 years showed actually the number of livestock actually have grown uh, from what used to be 25 million to about 60 million. The prices for cattle, for Kashmir, for also agricultural products also going up. Um, and although the infrastructure cost and the distances cause it more difficult for herders you know to be more competitive because you know it, uh, you have to pay more prices for petrol and for transportation etc i think uh, we would like the nomadic traditional uh, traditions to stay and maybe become even more competitive and of c I, I think one can combine you know that with some modern technologies most of the Nomadic herder families nowadays will have a solar panel and a small wind turbine and they will have uh, electricity and many of them will probably have a computer there and then there is a mobile system across the country and then they can use uh, mobiles as well. So we hope that they can combine and uh, become more competitive in the market economy. We don't want uh, just to change the traditions and just uh, lose that tradition as well. Thank you.